Amen and praise God family again. We are so appreciative that you're able to join us here this Sunday and every Sunday at Roots in Christ Ministries. I praise God for you. I praise God that he's allowed you to bless us. And then even my prayer is that we continue to be a blessing to you as we live in faith and we love in Christ. Amen. Tell you what, I just got a few notes here, a few things I want to speak to. If you would, please join me in the book of Luke, the book of Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 24. Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 24, and it reads, Also a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table, but I am among you as one who serves? You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. We're going to stop right there for this Sunday. I'm going to use as a subject, how good is the service at your table? How good is the service at your table? Reading this text, it reminds me how fruitless and pointless some of our arguments are, right? I mean, and I'm talking about arguments that we almost hear on a daily basis to today, arguing at the end of the day, arguing over nothing, nothing relevant, nothing substantive, no meaning, just pointless, 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 but we vigorously debate these things. Uh, such arguments are who is the greatest baller of all time? Is it Michael? Or is it LeBron? And you don't even have to say their full names. When you say Michael, you know who I'm talking about when it's when it's associated with the greatest baller, Michael or LeBron. Likewise, who are the greatest rappers? Could Is it Biggie or is it Tupac? People are still debating this, right? But then when it comes to uh, pop music, who's the king of pop, it's been debated who is the greatest. Yeah, Michael. Another Michael. All you have to say is his first name, Michael or Prince. But then now, even by today's standard, Prince may have fallen off of this argument. So the debate now is between Michael and Drake, right? Give props to where props is due. But I'll tell you, saints of God, frivolous arguments pop up out of nowhere. Pastor went to the gym the other day. I walk in the gym and a young man yells out to a whole group of, of other men saying, hey, Who's the sexiest man in the world? And the first thing pastor's thinking is, is really? By whose standard is the sexiest man, right? And he goes, no, no, no. And, you know, because the guys are kind of looking at him like, man, are we allowed to answer this question and still maintain the man, you know, the bro code on this thing? And he goes, no, I'm serious. He's like, let's Ryan Reynolds or what's his name? Chris Hemsworth. Chris, one of, those are some sexy guys. He goes, but Ryan Reynolds is one sexy guy. I'll say it. I'm comfortable. And, you know, and uh, most of the guys are like, okay, right? But this, he was just ready to debate point for point and, and, and identify why, right? Pointless. It's just as pointless as that age-old argument that, that couples have, particularly newlyweds, is the toilet tissue roll. How should it be mounted? How should it be mounted? Rolling out or rolling in, Right? Rolling out over the top, coming out, or rolling on the backside, right? What's people? These, this, these are real debates. We've had these, right? But, but even more so, I'm looking at the apostles here in the text, right? These disciples, and they're arguing over who would be considered the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
and what's even makes it funnier is if if you read text prior to where we are here in Luke chapter 22, uh, chapter 22, looking at verse 22, going back up, we find here where Jesus Christ identifies that someone is going to betray him. So they, initially their response is like, well, you know, who will it be? Who will it be? Who will it be? And I envision someone said, well, it won't be me because I'm going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Not that the scriptures clearly says that. I can just see it. Won't, won't be me because I'm going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then another one said, you can't be the greatest. I'm going to be the greatest. And then they begin to, to argue over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of, of heaven. But I love how Jesus corrals this conversation in order to give his perspective. If we look here, Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 25, he says, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors, benefactors. Jesus wants to give the perspective of, hey, look, you know what? We're looking at what's taking place in the world here today. And in other words, the kings here get off of saying it's good to be the king, right? It's good to be the king, high and mighty and pompous, right? All of their majesty and all of their grandeur as king, parading it over people who have lesser and whose in society are considered lesser, yet they consider themselves benefactors? They're benefactors, really? And even if we look at this word benefactors, it comes from the Greek word your GTs, your GTs, which means a helper of the people. I've got to go here because how, how are you really helping somebody when you're lording your parade, your shine, your glory over them? How are you helping them, particularly those that are in need? And, and, and I've got to go here because how many of us get there? In, in life, in life, be it the job, just be it in life, we push, we press, we jockey in pursuit of positions for promotions and prestige. And then when we finally get a little bit of rise a little bit, we begin to look down on the little people. Yeah, you might even, we might even really just be on that next rung on, on a ladder. We just stepped up one rung, just a little bit higher than people, but we look down on them and we don't recognize them even as people that are equal to us. We see them below us. And here's the funny thing. We were just there yesterday. How many of us have that attitude? I'm getting too excited. Let me, let me slow down. So not only do we wear this pomp in our pursuits, but we also put on some pomp in our leisure sometimes, if you're not careful, if you're not careful. And, and let's be real about this thing, saints. When there's nothing wrong with wanting to do something nice for yourself every now and then. As a matter of fact, there's nothing wrong with wanting to do something nice for your spouse. I mean, and, and think about what goes into a night out on the town, right? When, when you want to get your car right, you take it, get it clean, detail, interior, exterior. You get them to spray some new car smell in the car, right? Get some armor all on the tires, clay bar wax. That's that's from up car guys, them clay bar make, make, makes the car shine. But then you get home, jump in the shower, you know, take a bath, whatever. For my ladies, you put on something nice, right? Something chic and unique. Pastor did. I just did a throwback to the 70s. You put on something chic and unique. You get your hair done did to the highest levels of didification. That means you're looking good and you know you're looking good. You spray it on just a little bit of beautiful, a little beautiful magnolia on. And then you toss on your Manolos with just a few of the toes poking out, right? You know you look good. And you're even impressed and you feel blessed if somebody calls you a diva. Pa Pastor's already talked about we need to stay away from this diva, which means goddess stuff. It, it, it's all right to feel like you're looking good, but, but you don't need to be a goddess, right? But for my fellas, right, we're throwing on maybe a three-piece suit, something nice, maybe a Hugo Boss, Calvin Klein or whatever. Have on a, a nice little vest, different color. So that it kind of offsets a little bit and nice tie. You go in your closet to look for your shoes. You don't know if you want your, your Bruno Mollies, your, your, your Johnson and Murphys, or you might even throw on some Stacy's just to take it back a tad, right? But you spray on some of that Versace Eros. Yeah. We clean up really well, and we're doing it Big Willie style at night. We're jumping in the whip. We're going to the restaurant. We might even have the vehicle valet parked. And then we're at the table bossing and ordering the waiter around. Garcon! Garcon! And then your wife has to correct you. That's Garcon, baby. Garcon. All right, Garcon. Bring me a bottle of your, of your finest. 
But I love how Jesus brings us back to reality and puts everything in perspective. Reading here in Luke chapter 22, verse 26. It says, but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. See, Jesus is trying to get us out of this worldly minded perspective. Saints of God, when, when we maintain this worldly perspective and we don't consider Christ, we miss the heavenly aptitude and altitude where he wants to take us. Because in heaven, the greatest is not going to be the one who has played all of the, the social and the, the, the workplace politics or even our, our politics politics. It's not going to be the one who's people pleasing, not going to be the one who's seeking personal pleasure or pleasures of pounding people to pulps in order to make it. That's not the one who's going to be the greatest. The greatest is going to be the, the innocent, right? The, one, the greatest among you should be like the youngest. We're talking about innocence, one of no reputation, one who's not lording themselves over others, but someone who's humble and meek, finding themselves a servant to others. So if you were to take a personal assessment, a personal assessment, a tally of your life's accomplishments, what would they look like? What would they look like? And then, are you proud of your accomplishments in life? And you may say, well, pastor, is that a bad thing to be proud of my accomplishments? Well, I, I don't know. Let's, let's talk a little bit. Do any of your accomplishments consider serving others or helping them get somewhere or encouraging somewhere to go beyond where they normally would, where someone might fall, but you encourage them so that at least they hold on, hold on, hold on to make it to that next level? In your accomplishments, do you even look back to see if there's anyone who might need your help or are you just fully throttled looking forward about your business trying to be about you? Understand, saints of God, one of the reasons why, and I'm going to help somebody with this here. One of the reasons why we stay so miserable with all of our accolades, all of our accomplishments, all of our uh, exceptional performance awards, all of these things. One of the reasons why we stay so miserable is because the most valuable part of who you are, who God made you, is not being satisfied. Yes. That's why so many people have so much. And it's almost vanity. Nothing is being satisfied. Don't you know, saints of God, just helping someone will make you feel better? Helping someone. We've got to get our mindset off of ourselves and start looking toward, since God has positioned us somewhere, who is it, Lord, that you want me to help? Jesus goes on here in Luke chapter 22, verse 27. He says, for who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table, but I am among you as one who serves? Jesus right now is blowing our mind because we esteem, we adore, we exalt Jesus Christ as our Lord, but he's trying to say, I'm not the one sitting at the table who in this society is recognized as being the greater one, saints. We need to get up from the table and we need to look to serve. Jesus is setting the tone as to how we should engage life. We should have a servant mentality, not a slave mentality, but a servant mentality. One who places themselves under to build under others to build them up, putting ourselves into positions where we're able to help people. Yes, that does mean even with your promotions, even with your accolades, how can I help someone with this? The higher you go up in the chain, the greater is your sphere of influence to help others. I've had at least four friends approach me this week and share with me just how, <clears throat> how they can't stand their jobs. I mean, and, and, and some of them are actually doing things that they in, enjoy, you know, doing as a career, but just the circumstances and the predicaments and things that are going on. And at the end of the day, let's be real about this, saints. A lot of times it's the people. It's the people. Sometimes it's the system. It just, but, but 
just right now, people are being inundated and overwhelmed just with everything going on from COVID to, to the attitudes of people in the workplace. And I even had one friend come to me and, and it resonated in my spirit when she said it. She said, she or she asked me the question, why do I put myself through this? And I thank God for his Holy Spirit because he gave, he gave me the answer. And my answer to her was, why do you put yourself through this? And I know to some of you saying, well, well Pastor, you didn't answer the question. That was, I want to slap you. You say something. Well, look, it was a Holy Spirit moment, saints, because she understood what I was saying. Understand, saints of God, when we are in a situation in life where we find ourselves and we aren't enjoying the moment, the question that is pertinent to ask is, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Because no matter how high you get up in whatever organization, no matter how far you go, at the end of the day, what you need to know is your purpose for why you're doing what you do. Otherwise, it's vanity. And it's different things for different people. Some people are doing it because they need to feed their families. Some people are doing it because they love what they're doing. Some people are doing it because there's greater purpose beyond just themselves and their personal attitudes and mindsets. But you've got to know your purpose for doing what you're doing. Otherwise, it's just vanity. But if you need to know why, you want to know why you do what you do? Here's a good start. Stand by Jesus. Stand by Jesus. Looking at Luke chapter 22, verse 28, Jesus says, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. I read again, you are those who have stood by me in my trials, saints of God. If we stood by Jesus, that means some of the trials that we've seen, we've seen Jesus even in his own town where he, he performed the fewest miracles. Why? Because the people knew him and they could not receive him as the Messiah. They could not receive him because they remember when he was just a little young pup running through the, the streets with, with a snotty nose. They, they remembered him when, when he would cry in the middle of the night, keep, keeping people up, right? They, they, they know too much uh, about him, even to recognize his greatness. But understand, saints of God, if, if, if we're going to spend time with Jesus, then at the end of the day, we need to talk to God and ask God, what is your plan? Because just sometimes God will have you pack up and, and go. He's got work for you to do. But where you are right now, people people won't listen. People won't, they won't receive you. They, 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 they won't ingest the goodness that you have. They don't want to hear you. They know when you used to make mistakes, right? I'm not talking about Jesus, but now we're talking about you. They know when, you, when you've had shortcomings. They know when you've lied. They know when you've stolen, right? They, they know that you're so soft and you're so meek. How can that person lead us? They, they know you too well. Sometimes the Lord will pick you up and move you along. And you may say, well, is that running away? Pastor, no, not if not if God told you to go. It's, it's not running away. Understand, saints, that if you stood by Jesus, that means you were there when he was being constantly attacked by the Pharisees, constantly challenging him on God's word that God gave them, not recognizing that he is the living confirmation and affirmation of God's word. If we stood by Jesus when he healed the sick and healed the blind and healed the lame and rose the dead to life, if we stood by him where he was constantly moving and constantly going and constantly giving of him, himself, you would think that we would learn something from Jesus if, if you stood by him, if you stood by him. If you stood by him, you would you would have learned a little something. You would have learned what, why you go to church. You would learn why you get into God's word. You would learn why you do all of this Christian stuff, right? Not, 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 not trying to knock it. I'm just saying to some people, it's just stuff. It's just action. And then even looking at Jesus, everything had a purpose. So if there's purpose in this stuff, the thing is we actually need to now recognize that this stuff is not your average is stuff. Somebody ought to say amen. And then if we continue on here in Luke chapter 22, verse 29, where Jesus says, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me. Confer, confer. A confer is, is an arrangement, but it's a will or a decree, right? Jesus is saying, I willed, on you a kingdom. You're in my will. You're in my will. 
just as my father willed one on me. You're in God's will. So here we pick up in Luke 22, verse, verse 30. Here Jesus says, so that, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I want to leave this up on the screen because I want to walk through this a little bit, right? So he's saying so that you may eat and drink at my table. Don't miss it, saints of God. Jesus is here to serve them. He's here to serve them. He's here to feed them. He's here to provide them sustenance. Saints of God, we should not be ashamed or afraid to be at Christ's table for him to serve us recognizing saints of God that what he's investing is in us is not for the sake of fatness, but for the sake of sufficiency. God wants to provide for us at his table. That means what he has prepared for us. But check this out in his kingdom, meaning he's the king, he's the Lord, he's ruling and he's going to serve us. But look also what he gives us to sit on thrones. What's the throne for? He rules, but we are judging. For And this is for the disciples to judge the 12 tribes, right? How many disciples? 12, 12 disciples to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Saints of God, this still is no different than our call because I, I've, I've preached this time and time again. I'm just not going to deep dive into this. I'm just going to share with you. A lot of times when people want to use the Tupac rhetoric, only God can judge me. It's not biblical, it's not Christian, and it's not right. Because if you go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, where people start out, where it says, do not judge or you will be judged. People stop there and they totally miss the fact when you continue on, Jesus clears everything up where he says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. In other words, get rid of the hypocrisy in your life. Judges can't be hypocrites, but they need to be clear seeing, sober minded, then you can be a judge. Not only to miss the fact, saying to God, if you go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 3, where it says, do you not know that, that we will judge angels? We will judge angels. We are judges, saints. So let's stop being afraid. Right now, the United States, let me help you. Right now, the world needs judges. The world needs us to step up, to assume our position, because we are in a desperate need of people of sound, firm faith making sober decisions. And what does that mean? What does that mean to us? It means there's a mental shift that we need to have, right? Because I think, I think even when you're hearing this message right now, you're saying, hold on, Pastor, you went from talking about being a servant to being a judge, and, and they just don't seem to go together. But understand, saints of God, they, they do. They really do. Don't you know the first part of being a judge is actually recognizing that someone is in need? Uh-huh. Yeah, being a judge. The first part of being a judge is recognizing that someone is in need. Let, let me flip this back on you. So when you're in a restaurant and you're standing there with a pitcher of water, you're constantly looking to see if there is a need to fill someone's empty glass. Understand, saints of God, in life, it's the same thing. People get tired. People run out. They get empty. And God has placed you in people's lives so that you can serve them a cool glass of water. We're talking about from the eternal wellspring of Jesus. Amen. The second part of being a judge is recognizing that we must stay filled with current or fresh legal knowledge. Right. Pastor, how are you going to tie this into being a, a sermon? Well, let me help you. When you are in the restaurant serving and your pitcher, you're constantly pouring into others, at some point you need fresh and current, current water, right? You don't want any old stale water. You want some fresh water so that you can fill others. Let, let, let's apply this to life now. I don't know about you, saints of God, but pastor has a full I have a full life, a very full life. I'm not saying my life is any more full than anyone else's, but I will say that there are times that I, I sow into so many different things that I run low on my energy. As a believer, 
God has given us a few things to make sure that we always maintain a strong energy source. These things that he's given us is his word, preaching, prayer, and fellowship. You know, if you miss any one of these things, any one of them, you can find yourself running out just like that, just by missing one of these. What are you saying, pastor? Well, even if you get God's word, if you stay in God's word, you're reading God's word, but to read God's word without the prayer, you're really missing what God wants to say to you through his Holy Spirit so that he can move the seeds that he's planted through you reading his word to apply it to your life. It's, it's like getting the tools, but unless you know how the tools work, you need the Holy Spirit to show you how the tools work. Otherwise, you're just looking at a toolbox saying, what is this? It looks funny. No. God gives us his word. We spend time with him in prayer. He gives us the purpose on how to use the word. And also, if all this prayer with no word is no power because you don't even know how to pray. You don't. The word tells us you don't even know what to ask for. You don't know how to pray without God's word. And then there's preaching and no word. That's like you holding your hand out like this and me just pouring water in your hand. You, you might get a couple of good sips, right? Enough to sustain you for a while. But it's even that much better if you're in God's word and then you have the preaching and then you have your prayer because all of these things now work hand in hand through the Holy Spirit to give you guidance and give you clarification and understanding. And then even the fellowship is people sharing their life experiences and you sharing yours and what they've learned and y'all growing together. And what good is it to have all of these things and not be able to share it with someone all four of these things work hand in hand. We've got to stay in God's word, continue to seek the preaching, continue to remain in prayer and continue to be in fellowship with other believers. I got to throw that last part in there with other believers because if, if you find yourself in fellowship with people that are of darkness, the word tells us light and dark have no fellowship. There's nothing that, you, that light can gain from darkness other than more darkness. You get around the wrong people, they could potentially blow your light out. Yeah, yeah. Good Christian fellowship is important. And this is the third part, and this is what takes us home, is that the judge must be bold enough to hold the standard. Just as the judge must uphold the standard of law, we expect the servant to uphold the standard of good service. We have expectation that a judge would dispense a just ruling of guilty or not guilty. And these determinations are based on evidences that point in either direction. We don't expect a judge to send an innocent man to jail when the evidence proves that he's innocent and vice versa. Saints of God. Likewise, you don't expect, and, and let me help somebody because this is how God wants to move us. We have to be open and available to make sure that we're giving and dispensing and dispersing gifts, time, talent, treasure, whatever God has directed us to help people with to who he's directed it to. Understand, saints of God, if you give a gift to someone who does not have a purpose for it, a lot of times the gift is not fully appreciated. But don't you know that there are people praying just like you? There are people that are looking for God to move just like you. And for you to come along at the right time, that means when God sent you, to give just the right gift, that means what God has placed on your heart to give. Could be a kind word. Could be finances. Could be something they just need you to pick them up. Get them off the ground. There was no other way they could get up. But you came by just at the right time. Saints of God, being a servant and being a judge means that there's so much that God has for us. But, but the judgment part is just making sure that we're deferring to God for every move. Not legalistically, but 
availability for the Holy Spirit to take you to that next level in your walk. That's really where we want to be. That's really where we want to find our purpose. That's really how we really find it, that God is moving in our lives because now the things that I want to do are the things that I'm moving into and I didn't know that I wanted to do these things until I was open and available to hear God's voice through studying his word, through being in prayer, through hearing the preached word and by fellowshipping with Christian believers. I got to ask you at this point, right now, if I'm a guest at your table, how good is the service at your table? When the people are seated, are they being filled in a timely manner? Hear what I say, because there's a lot of people that, 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 that are going to want to reject this. I'm nobody's servant. But if Christ has set the example for us and all he wants to do is serve us, why do you think he's serving us? To be the example of how to serve others. It's not for our self-glorification. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes pastors just tired. Tired. Sometimes I don't hear my phone ring. But don't you know that when I do answer that phone and I talk to people that are in need, don't you know that the Holy Spirit is pouring and filling me even in the moment? It's almost like a perpetual motion type of thing. The more I do, the more the Lord fills me. Saints of God, I love being in service to the Lord. And I'm here to tell you that there's no sorrow that comes from it. My encouragement this week, this week, look around, look around and see if there's someone that God wants you to bless. And I'm talking about, even, and I want to go to work here just because there's a lot going on in people's lives, even at work. There's no shame in asking the Lord, Lord, what is going on here? What is it you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Where do you want me to go? Or are you telling me to leave, Lord? That's, that's a conversation between you and the Lord. But what you'll notice is the better your service at your table, you'll begin to find that more people will want to be seated by you. Yeah. It's not because of how good your cornbread is. It's because of how good your service is. Amen. Eternal and almighty Lord, again, we thank you for such a, a glorious opportunity to fellowship and to hear your word. Lord, right now, I just ask that you move. Take this word and move. Take this word and move on the hearts of the believer to recognize that, that this life that we're living, dear Lord, it's, it's not for vain purposes. We're not just going through the motions. We should not be rushing through our, our week to, to hurry to get to the weekend. We should be savoring and enjoying every moment. We should be looking. And when I say enjoy, Lord, I mean enjoying serving you. Enjoying serving you. Looking for people to serve looking for people who need service, and then looking to you for what is your will for us in their lives. My prayer, dear Lord, is that you, that you fill and that you evoke a response in the heart of the believer that desires to serve you and that they continue to be blessed all the days of their life. Thank you, Lord, for being available Give us just what we need. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Saints, God bless.